Hello, everybody. How's it going? <clears throat> Swag Baby Pro 69. I'm not sure if that's like a troll name or not, so we'll wait and see. But how's it going? And hi, Boxers. How are you doing? So today we are going to be coding temporal gizmos. <laughs> And I will explain what that means because it does not sound like anything that you would know of and it doesn't, it shouldn't. So um, I've been doing a lot of different stuff on this. Uh, I have redesigned all of this, kind of like changed the layout and stuff. And what I'm gonna do real quick too is I'm gonna hide the chat box on the stream output so you guys can see what's going on so we'll hide this for now and then i will put it back maybe later we'll see okay there we go so you can see that and then uh <laughs> it's still not going to show everything um what we'll do is let's see I'm trying to figure out what the best way to lay all this stuff out is uh if i move this down oh and i still haven't even transitioned the scene yet there we go. Okay, so that's the scene transitioned. Let's move this down here and this up here. And Adrian DeWinter, thank you for subscribing with Prime for five months. Uh, thanks. Good to see you. Let's see if we can actually get this thing working so I can show you guys what's happening here. Um, okay, so I've got all this. And then if I move this down, there we go. You guys should be able to see that. Let me know if you can. I'm going to hide one more thing as well just so that we can get... A little bit more visibility um, and I may consider just keeping the streams like this we'll try this out and then people who are watching this on video later on YouTube uh, let me know what you think and we can change stuff up so for now though this is what we'll try so and I'm also gonna this is the export video panel we'll just put this over here because it doesn't matter too much uh, drag that there okay so this is pretty good we can kind of see everything okay um, and then last thing, I do have to move this down here too. <laughs> okay, it's kind of cluttered, but unfortunately, that's the easiest way to kind of show off all this stuff. And I still have to figure out like a better UI layout and everything eventually. Uh, we'll see how that goes. Uh, actually, this should be up here. This should be down here. Okay. Okay, here we go. And now I can show how all this stuff works, which we'll get to in just a second. Essie Woods, how's it going? Good to see you. Playing around with the stream schedule. Yes. Um, have we taken an early weekend? Yes. And I am traveling. So uh, got to leave like right after this stream basically and drive for five hours, which is why we're doing a little bit earlier. And IT0946, may I ask what gizmos are referring to in this context? So in this context, this is exactly what we we're going to get to. Right now, we have this whole scene, right? Where I basically have this animation. Um, you can see it does a few different things here. Uh, I've changed like sort of the whole way this works. Sometimes you start coding something and you think that it'll work the way that it should. And if you watched the previous streams, um, you probably have an idea of kind of how this whole animation thing worked. Where basically we had animation objects in the scene here and then you could drop them down and like add animations to it. That was stupid, <laughs> okay? Uh, I had to completely change the way I thought about this because it just did not work right. So. Now what happens is we have a scene hierarchy panel. You can see over here, we've got the red square, which is this. We have a blue square, which is this guy. And you can kind of see the properties changing down here as we go through too. We have a circle, uh, that's a green circle actually. And you can see that if I change that, it changes the background color over there. And then we have the hello world object, which is the text up there, and then a yellow circle. So this is kind of our scene hierarchy panel. And you can drag stuff around here, right? So it's like a unity or whatever scene panel where you drag stuff around. You can reorder it, all that stuff, reparent. Right now, the parenting doesn't actually do anything, but it will soon. Um, point is, this is kind of the workflow I'm going for. So you get your scene objects. Then you have your timeline, and your timeline has animations. So for instance, this is a create animation. And if we open this up, we can see that this create animation, I know it's kind of small here too, so let's do that a little bit. This create animation has animation objects, right? And so basically what these are, you can see it's the red square, the blue square, uh, circle, yellow circle. And then if I drag the hello world object, it would actually break because I don't have support for that on a create animation. But basically, let's see, if I remove the yellow circle, you can see that it removed it from here. And the reason it did that is because now technically the yellow circle doesn't exist anymore since 
it hasn't been created, right? And you can see that this kind of affects which objects will go through there. So then if I want to add another animation object to this animation specifically that plays at this time, I go, okay, let's add a new one. And then I drag my yellow circle. Now I've got the yellow circle back, right? And, and for some reason, this just makes so much more sense to me intuitively. And it works a lot better, just like everything works out. Because now I can not only have like a create animation running, but I can also do like multiple move to animations. And also when I group these together, I can say like, hey, do a lag start where all of these start at different times. So if you notice, uh, these are actually slightly offset, right? If you look at all the animations in there, they're slightly offset. All the ones that are affected by this, this one's further along than this one, this one, and this one, right? So it's kind of lagging each one, but I can switch it to be synchronous down here. So if we do a synchronous playback start, uh, and now they play at the same time. So they're in sync, right? So now they're all exactly the same time. And let's do that one more time. Change this to asynchronous or a lagged start. And then there. And actually, we can exaggerate that effect a little bit more to make it more pronounced. So if I set that to 0.5, the lag start ratio, um, yeah, now you can really see, right? They, they wait a little bit until they all start, but they all finish at the same time, which is kind of the whole point of this. And this is directly stolen from three blue and browns math animation editor. So yes, he designed a good system. I'm stealing ideas from it and applying it where applicable, you know? So anyways, that's how that all kind of works. But the whole, I've kind of shifted the whole concept on its head. Before I had animation objects where you could add animations to. Now we have animations in our timeline that we can add animation objects that exist in a scene hierarchy to here. And this is good. Because now it means like if I ever want to do a replacement transform or something, which is where like, say I want to morph this square into this green circle, I could drag a replacement transform, which I don't have set up yet. And then say basically, hey, replace this square with the circle. And then it should morph it and it should all just kind of work out. And then the scene hierarchy panel will update to reflect this change. And so these are kind of the changes I'm heading for. And it just, it makes a lot more sense. So... <laughs> Maybe not right now for you guys and stuff too. Hopefully it does make sense intuitively. But um, for me, this definitely feels much better and I'm really happy with the way this is going. Uh, so I'll go through too real quick. We can just like quickly create something. So if I drag a new animation down there, we'll do a... I think I only have move to and create set up right now. So I'll just do another move to here, right? And we'll move this down to here. So if I want to do that, I go down here, I go into my scene panel, I add an object, I want to move my hello world object. So I'll drag that there. And you can see it's already changed it. That's because the move to, if we look in its inspection settings, has a target position. So now if I modify this target position, it's going to change where this guy moves to. So now this moves that guy, right? We could add more ab objects to this though, too, if we wanted. So if I add another object here, I could say also move the blue square there. And now the blue square moves there too, see? So it all just makes so much more sense. Um, and then I can also remove it. So if I decide, oh no, actually I don't want to, just remove it, worked out. So yeah, uh, very happy with this so far. Now gizmos, uh, I think IT0946, you asked this just a second ago. What are gizmos in this context? Well, you saw how I had to kind of go over here to move this guy. I had to like go down here and then I had to say, okay, let's move the target position. This is all unwieldy and stuff, right? So what I want is I want to have like a transformation gizmo, which is like the little square arrow arrow. And I want to be able to like, just pick it up and say, Hey, drag this guy like down to here and then visually see this stuff. But <laughs> this is the hard part. There's a timeline, the positions change. So what does it mean to pick this object up when my timeline cursor is here and move it? What am I changing? And so that's kind of the hard part that I don't quite have figured out yet, but I, I have an inkling of an idea of how we're going to solve this. Let me check chat real quick and then I'll continue. Okay, so Essie Woods, may I ask, where are we traveling? I am going to Cincinnati to visit a friend, so it's uh, going to be fun. And Clo Matrix, hello, what is this project? How's it going? Uh, it's, uh, like video animating software or something. Exactly. So I used to use three blue and browns, um, Manum, which you can look up. It's Manum community edition, which is great, but it had some drawbacks. And so I've commute, uh, created my own and this is basically, 
so yeah this is manum community edition which is what uh three blue and brown uses to create his animations essentially i'm creating a drop in replacement except it's real time and it fixes some of the things that were wrong with the other one uh like textures and 3d support wasn't the greatest so just kind of going and fixing that stuff um it0946 uh, had just joined the stream so i can't see you'd sent a similar message before <laughs> um Nidal, good to see you and Voxer, so it's like an animation group. Yes, it is like an animation group in Manum, if you're familiar with Manum terms. Uh, but I'm kind of glad I don't have to do those specific phrases. And since I have a scene hierarchy panel over here too, it's it's uh, a little bit more involved than that too because soon I'm going to be able to say like, hey, this circle is a child of this, right? And so presumably if I drag this blue circle or blue square into there, it should move all its children with it and stuff. So... There's going to be like loads of interactions that you can kind of dynamically create, which I think is going to be very cool. Um, and Voxers and camera transforms also make sense now. Yes. So that is another big thing. Voxers helped me add camera transforms, but it didn't make much sense because what does it mean when you don't have a camera object in here? But now the scene will contain a camera object that you'll be able to move around and stuff inside of this panel. So um, this panel is just nice because it gives a sense of like activeness or inactiveness to these objects, which will kind of come up soon and swag baby pro is this made in vulcan it is OpenGL. um i started learning vulcan like a couple weeks ago but it's very difficult and i'm definitely not ready to uh make a full-fledged application it just yet and as you would will i go into the shader and add stuff like lighting yes i already do for 3d objects but they're all kind of broken right now because made a lot of changes <laughs> and glow matrix it looks really cool thank you okay so how do we get gizmos to work in this context then, right? Because like, I can't just slap a gizmo on here and say, hey, let's just put it wherever the object is like at this point when my cursor is here, because what value am I changing? Like, what does it mean to move it when it's here, right? Is that changing this animation? Is that changing the start position? Is that changing? So it kind of throws things for a loop and I've got a quasi solution and we'll see how this works and uh, yeah. Another guy in the chat, how much hours have I put into this? Looks amazing. Thank you. Um, I've, so I have not released a YouTube video in over like 120 days. So like, I think that's what, four months. So probably, yeah, many hours. <laughs> um, the core logic and stuff though, for the actual animations is probably the easiest part. The hardest part has been just getting like, figuring out a, it, an architecture that kind of works for this, like doing the the actual rendering so the hardest part so far have been this stuff where i can take an svg object and kind of draw it out and then fill it in that's been super hard and then figuring out like the proper architecture for all this has been the other hard part which doing the actual rendering is surprisingly easy <laughs> compared to the rest of the stuff but uh yes many hours so my idea is if we click an object right so if I click circle here, I already kind of have a couple of these concepts laid out. So I have this position, right? But what does this position change? If I were to change this, that changes this start position. So you can see at the create here, it's going to change because we haven't moved this object at all. We're talking about the hello world object. I haven't moved it and I have hello worldy because I want to make sure that like characters that go below the baseline work. So yeah, that's why it's worldy and not just world. But <laughs> If I move this, it moves in time, right? Which kind of makes sense because we haven't actually applied any move animations. But then if I move it and then I move this, it does nothing. And the reason it does nothing, it's actually doing something, right? If I go back here now, it's actually moved the beginning. So my idea is when you click on an object, the gizmo pops up in its start position. So even if the object is over here, the gizmo would be here because that's the start position. And when you modify that gizmo, you modify the start position, right? But how do you know kind of where it's moving? And so then that's kind of like the second part. So there will be multiple gizmos on the screen. Animations will have different kinds of gizmos. And basically, if you click on an object, it'll show all of the animation gizmos and it will show the uh, gizmo for the start position of the object and those types of settings. But then if you click on animation here, it'll show just that specific gizmo. And what it'll show is like where it starts, which would be here, 
with like a circle that's non-editable or something because that's just defined by like wherever the animation is here. And then it would show like a dashed line and then it would show a gizmo here that you can alter because if I change this, that does change the end position. And then I can drag it around from here and kind of change that path. And so this is kind of the direction we're going to be going. And that's what we're going to be trying to implement today. I've already started implementing a little bit of it, but we're going to be doing all the interesting parts uh, right now. So also, I have a hard stop at 9 a.m. So I'm probably going to wrap this up by 8.45 a.m. at the latest. Uh, don't want to go on too long. But yeah. And Happy Flap, is this your own tool? What is this? Yes, this is my own tool. It's open source. You can compile it yourself, but it's a pain to compile. So I will be selling binaries once it is like complete, which is still a long ways away. I guess like another year at least before I feel comfortable selling anything. And I've made some products with it. But if you do want to check it out, it is here. And I'll post this in the chat. So you can check it out here. Master Branch is fairly stable, but if you do make a project with it or something, don't expect that to persist because project settings change quite a bit. Uh, so like, and what I mean by that is when you open it up, it does pop up a project screen and you can do like a new project or you can just open up a project that you were in. Um, one other thing, so a couple things I've implemented since the last stream as well. Uh, the whole editor has changed. So I've changed the styles, the colors, everything. I've still got some work to do. It looks kind of ugly in my opinion. Um, I've got to make the colors mesh a little bit better, but I'm happy with it so far. I have also added serialization so that you can keep track of the timeline. So it remembers where your cursor was, reapplies all that state. And um, interesting thing. So if we take a look at the project file real quickly, because this is just a little aside before we get into the real meat of the stream. Uh, so if we take a look at the project file, which is in here, uh, let's just drag it in here. It's just binary, but it's not scary binary. You can kind of see things, right? So like we have the blue square, which is the name of that object. We also have like hello worldy, which is the text inside of that thing. Well, uh, one thing that I've done is I've created a table of contents in the binary file. And if we take a look at the code, this is kind of how it looks. And let's also stop this. So if I go to uh, application.cpp, we can kind of see the, oh, and I'm already in here. The, how do we load a project? Well, the way we load a project is basically we read the project file, uh, dump it into some memory and RAM, right? So we just read it in. And then I do this thing called table of contents, deserialize. What is the table of contents? Well, if we look at this, table of contents basically has the size of the table of contents, and then it has the entries and a magic number, which if we look, it's cool cafe. So if we were to look into here, we can actually see that the table of contents ends right here where we see cool cafe in binary. So we have this little pre kind of section. Uh, and also another guy in chat. Thank you for following. Good to see you. Uh, I know you chatted before too, but thank you. Cool. Um, so you can see this is kind of like this little pre section, which we've got. And what this does is it gives me offsets into the binary for the start of different sections. And so you can see we've also got this thing animation data and timeline data. And what this is, <clears throat> is it's like the offsets into it. So what we have is we have an offset, which is right here. Uh, and if we actually look at this, we can see if it's uh, uint64, which I believe it is. No, nope, int32. <laughs> uh, I think this is... Wait, no, I'm looking at the wrong thing. Okay, so if we look here... <laughs> No, okay, we got zeros. Wait a second, let's check this out. So I got cool cafe. And then how does the rest of this work? That's not what I meant to press. And then each entry looks like, let's see, we've got it somewhere here. Okay, so we have the entry, okay, that's the the length of the name. And then we have the data offset and then the data size. Okay, so this is the length of the name animation data, right? 14. So there's 14 characters in here. If we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So that just tells me that. Then we have, this is the data offset. So I believe, right? Yeah, data offset, which is a size T. So that's eight bytes. And then data size, which is also a size T. So that would be an int 64, which is zero. So we're offset zero. If we go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And then, is that right? Maybe that was just four. One, two, three, four. 
No, I think I'm counting wrong here. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then here. I've gotta be looking at this wrong because that doesn't seem right. <laughs> but basically what it's supposed to be is it's supposed to, oh, maybe it's um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. No, that's right. I think I'm just off by one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, I was off by one. And then we have this, there we go, that makes sense. So 764 bytes, and that tells me how big the data is. And if we go, that was seven, eight, I think, right? Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I know you guys probably didn't wanna look at binary today, but I find this stuff interesting, so I hope you guys do too. Uh, and then if we look at this guy, this is the size of the next character, which is a 13, right? So one, two, three, four. Then we go here, timeline data, that's 13 characters long. We can count that if we want. And then it ends with a null byte, which is why it was off by one. And then we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's the offset, which if we look at this, uh, 764, which is the size of the last entry. I don't know if you guys, so if you rewind, size of the last entry was 764 bytes. That's the offset of this guy. And then it has the size of this, which is 17 bytes. Um, so basically what that tells me is like down here, we have the timeline data. and so. All this to say, why, what's so great about this? Well, the great thing about this is I can corrupt this, right? Let's go, okay, so dead beef is the end of the last one because I have magic numbers everywhere to help me like kind of go through this. If I were to delete this character, which can I do that? Um, or can I just like change this? I don't know, can I delete some characters? Can I modify the binary? I don't know. We can do it in the code, it's easier. <laughs> so if we go into the application.cpp, right? We basically get the animation data, which we say, hey, give me this guy, which it gets, it goes and looks in the table of contents, finds the offset and all that stuff, and then gives us the actual memory, which we get here, and then same thing for timeline data. And then what I can do is I can corrupt some memory, right? So I can say timeline data dot free, or we'll actually just say timeline data dot data, uh, zero equals, no, nah, this doesn't work either. We'll say timeline data dot resize, no? Uh, we'll just say free. Okay, so we're going to free it, and then I won't free it here. So technically, this is corrupt memory. If we look at free, it frees it, sets the size to zero, all that stuff. Wait, that's not going to be corrupt memory either. Let's write some garbage there afterwards. So then we'll say timeline data dot write uint64, and we'll just write some random data. My point is I'm trying to corrupt the binary file uh, to show how you can recover these types of things uh, equals that okay so we do this what's going to happen if we load our file now this should corrupt that data right but it's only going to corrupt the timeline so if we go here uh i've completely corrupted it try to allocate reallocate a block memory that was not allocated by this library uh it's because i freed it okay last thing <laughs> i also have to say after this timeline data dot init uh size of uint 64. Okay, so I forgot to initialize it. Now if we go, <laughs> we're gonna have some corrupted memory. I promise this is going somewhere. There we go, okay. So we've got deserialized bad data. Oh, no, that was a really bad corruption. <laughs> okay, I give up. Basically my whole point was, if you do it this way, what you can do is you can detect when you deserialize bad data and then as long as it's only in a portion of the data, right? So like if it's just the timeline, then you can abort that. And so you just don't load this in. But since this isn't important, we can continue loading the project and we can load the animation data. And it all just kind of works out. I had a great example earlier this week, but unfortunately, I never saved the code for the good examples. Okay, uh, you can see everything just kind of works out here. I still loaded it because I never saved anything out again. Um, we'll get into gizmos because that was kind of an aside. But whole point, table of contents has a, a reason. And it's so that if you ever corrupt a piece of a file, you can still jump around that file and get pieces that were not corrupted and hopefully continue to load your data. Um, and so table of contents are good that way. Boxers. Maybe storing the actual entry name of the table header is weird there. Just storing the enum ID of the entry may be nicer. Yeah, but it's it's not like it's a lot of processing or anything. So 
Okay, and it makes it really easy. Like if I jump into here, you know, I can see and be like, oh, that's where it is. And then I can just jump one byte ahead and immediately be able to tell where stuff is. So I like this. I know it's not necessary. And like I could also hash the string or do whatever. Uh, but I, I think this is nice. Makes it easier for me, at least. I don't know. But let's move on. So gizmos, how are we going to do this? Let's start with the simplest thing. I want to get a gizmo working so that if I click red square, a gizmo pops up over the center of the red square and then I can click it, drag it around. That's our goal. So let's do that. Okay. So if we go into application.cpp, I've already kind of structured this out a little bit. We've got, if we're not outputting a video file, which means we're not rendering the final output. Uh, if we are, we don't want to render gizmos because that'll pollute the output. Uh, we go ahead and we say gizmo manager update first, and then we render it. This is kind of like I am GUI. I'm going for I am GUI style gizmo rendering. Um, so what this does is editor GUI gizmo. And then what this does is it goes to the active anim object. So the animation object that's currently active and the active animation calls their on gizmo functions, which currently do nothing. <laughs> uh, and so this is where we're going to start. If we go to, uh, we're in animation.cpp on gizmo. Okay, here we go. They do a little bit of something. Okay, here we go. Yeah. So on gizmo inside of our anim object, basically what we want to do is here we want to render and handle 2D gizmo logic based on the edit mode. So like if we're rotating object or translating or scaling, right? There's a few different things you can do. Um, we're just focusing on translating today. We'll focus on those other aspects later, uh, but they don't matter right now. So. We do that, and then after that, what we do is we call this render file, or render function. This goes through, collects all the gizmos that we've created, and this is very IAM GUI style. Iterates through them, it checks to see if they were actually updated in the last frame, which just means like somebody actually touched that gizmo. Draws it, um, and then it finishes. And the render function right now does nothing as well. <laughs> so uh, what we should do is like once we actually get into here, render free move should actually draw the state of the free move gizmo and all that stuff. And this all takes in a gizmo state, which has a status, which is none, hovered, or active. Uh, we might have more states in there more later. I don't know. And it also has the type. So we have free move, vertical, horizontal, which determines how the logic should be handled for all of these. Um, and then I'm going to add one more thing in here. Yes, we also need the position, which is kind of important. I think we need the position. Yes, we need the position. OK, so this is just give you the position that we draw it at. Um, we'll probably also need like uh, last position, which is the frame, the position it was at the last frame. That way, when we're dragging stuff, we can do that. Oh, yeah, that's another state, too. So we'll need a drag because you can drag stuff. Um, but maybe that can be encapsulated by active. I don't know. We'll figure it out. Okay, so I'm kind of just winging it here. This is how it all works. And basically what we do is every time you go in here and we call this, what we're going to do is the simplest thing here, gizmo manager. If we scroll up here and include that, uh, this is going to be core or actually editor gizmos and guess there's no other ones like that okay yeah so let's go there and go back here so i'll say gizmo manager uh free move gizmo and then this is kind of how it's going to work so we're going to give it a name which is this animation object's name or actually we're going to do this like well, kind of I am GUI style. So basically what this does is it's going to hash the string that I give it so that you can have multiple gizmos up. I'm kind of thinking forwardly here and do a bunch of stuff. <laughs> so uh, we'll say std string gizmo name equals uh, this name. And we'll just stringify this. Actually, we don't even need to. Well, OK, I could do like printfs or something to format it and do a C style, but I think I'm just going to do this. This is easier. Uh, so we'll do that, this name, plus um, std to string this ID, which should be unique. 
<clears throat> and we basically want to give it a unique string, a unique ID, because otherwise it'll collide with other gizmos, which isn't good. So we'll do that. We'll give it the C string uh, position, which is going to be this position start, because we're modifying the position start of this object. Oh, and I'm going to pass that by pointer instead. We'll change that in a minute. And then the free move variant, uh, we're going to do all. So like free move variant, you could do like free move variant. Uh, and then you could bitwise or these together, right? So you could have free move or horizontal move or vertical move. And you can kind of combine them so that you can do just one or all three uh, is kind of the idea there. But we're going to leave it as all, which should do all of them. So let's go into Gizmo Manager real quickly again. And this API might change too. I have no idea if this is a good API, bad API, uh, learning here. So I'm just trying things and then I will change as needed. So you got that. Okay, and then let's go back into here. Yeah, so we give that, why is this not happy? Do I need to give it a length? Is that better? No, you're still not happy. Is it because it's a char star and not a const char star? Or no, this is a uint8 star, isn't it? Yeah, okay. There we go. Now it's happy. And this should be a null, null byte ended string, so like a C string. Okay, so the idea is this, right? We'll be able to do this, and this should return a bool, actually. that will return a bool. So this is gonna be like, I am GUI style gizmos. And then we can say like, if this, basically that just means, hey, this object has now moved. And then, you know, we can update things as needed. Uh, right now, technically we don't need to do anything because this will just modify the vector directly. So nothing else should actually be needed here, but I like having that possibility where if you are using this API, you could go and then like have that trigger some sort of effect. You wanna draw something, you know, do something else like that. You can do that. Um, yeah, and I guess this is it. <laughs> so this is all that we're going to need for the API. Uh, it's going to get more complicated for animation since we actually have to draw stuff and everything. So that's the reason I'm kind of overcomplicating this a little bit. But yeah, so we got that. Now let's actually do the gizmo logic. So Okay, we'll do this, and then we're basically gonna say gizmo position equals position, right? Let's do this. First, I wanna render it. So let's see if we can figure out how to render it. Uh, another guy in the chat, what do I use to render the editor? Did I do it from scratch? Yes, kind of scratch, uh, OpenGL. So as scratch as OpenGL is. <laughs> um, I also use Nano VG for uh, drawing SVG paths. So I'm not doing that myself. Um, but then the text rendering, I think text rendering I'm doing through nano VG as well. So I'm actually parsing out the paths of the text rendering, the SVG paths, and then rendering that through nano VG. Um, okay. So, and we'll see all that in just a minute here. Cause I'm about to have to add some rendering things to get this to work. So to render the free move gizmo, which we have down here, Oh, and this isn't actually good. We actually want to do instead of a switch, because technically you could have all three. Uh, so we're going to change this up a little bit. We're going to say if gizmo type and that and we're going to comment that out and we're going to comment that out for now and then I'll fix that in a second. Uh, so basically we're doing this because technically you could have all three, which is what we have in this case. So we're going to do a bitwise and this is, oh, we have to do a uint8. So we and those together and then we want to check and see if that equals right. I think that's right. So if we do that, so if that's zero X, I guess zero B for binary. So if that's that, and then uh, we have zero B 
right? So this is our gizmo type, which means render all. And if we do this and this, we should get 0, 0, 1, 0, which should equal vertical move. Okay, yeah, so that works out. So we're basically going to do this, and then we'll render it if that's the case. Um, I should probably create some sort of wrapper for that eventually, but it doesn't matter. We'll do this, and gizmo type horizontal. I guess I don't need those extra parentheses either. Well, I might. I can never remember the precedence. Yeah, it looks like those have lower precedence. Okay, do that. And then we'll do this, which is gonna be free move. There we go, okay. Yes, I think that's right. Okay, so basically we're gonna do this and then we'll do the free move first, which is just gonna be the square. Uh, box rips, you don't need that equals equals vertical move. Uh, since it checks for non-zero. That's true. Yeah, that is true. Um, I always kind of bounce back and forth between that because that is true. It's uh, the only way it wouldn't equal zero is if it had garbage in there, which it shouldn't because this should always be, yeah, this is like three. Wait, why is that three? That should be something different so i'll have to check those in just a second that doesn't seem right um yeah that's not right okay wait a second i've got something up here oh i should be checking the free move variant okay should i be doing that wait a second Now I'm getting kind of confused. I did this last night and I'm trying to think of what I was thinking up there. So gizmo type. What am I passing for that? So if I do, okay, free move gizmo and then we have a variant. Yeah, I think I probably want to say like gizmo variant instead of type, which makes more sense. Does that make more sense? That does make more sense. Okay, so let's get rid of, okay, so that's what we want. I'm going to get rid of this thing because this makes no sense. Okay, and then this is going to be a uh, free move variant. Or maybe the type should be that. Yes, I think this is probably better. Okay, so we're changing some stuff up a little bit. Um, wait a second. I'm trying to think. So this is kind of like getting in my head a little bit because technically we're going to have gizmos that are like... Okay, so I think I need to change this. So this is a translation gizmo, right? Because we could have rotation. We could have scaling gizmos. And then I think we want a variant gizmo, which is a free standing variant, which just means like you can move it any direction, right? It just follows. And then a horizontal only, vertical only. And then we'll have all, which is like all those versions. Okay, I think this is what we want. Then, Let's go, where was I? <laughs> In here, okay, so then we have the type and then we have the variant. Okay, and that makes more sense. Okay, cool. And then we shouldn't have to, well, we, we will still have to pass that, okay. So variants, gizmo variants, all. Okay, so we'll still have to do that. Change that up. Oh, and then this will be translation. Okay. And then we'll have to change this. Okay, so this is translate gizmo. This is not a free move gizmo, which makes more sense. Okay, so we'll change that. 
And hopefully this makes some sort of sense. I'm sorry, I'm kind of figuring stuff out as I go along here. And I don't know how interesting of a stream that makes. <laughs> Okay, so we've got that. This makes more sense to me. We have a translate gizmo, and then what we'll have too is we'll have like rotate gizmo. I guess uh, we'll leave the gizmo in there. I guess we technically don't need that. And then we'll also have like a scale gizmo, right? And then this would be rotation, and this would be scale. Okay, yeah. Uh, BFY LAN, what is my keyboard name? I'm sorry, is the keyboard really loud? I have changed it since uh, a little bit ago, but the keyboard is, um, it's Logitech. I can't remember, I bought it recently, this is it though. So I'm actually really happy with it. But I just bought this recently, uh, I cannot remember the name. I think it's like MX9 or something, Logitech MX9, can't remember, uh, it's a 10 key and it has tactile key presses, so it should be like in between. But if they're too loud, let me know and I'll, uh, I'll figure something else out for new streams. <laughs> uh, okay, but yeah. So we got translate, rotate, scale. Translate, okay. And then we're gonna give it the variant. I think this works, yeah. It's not loud? Okay, that's good. <laughs> okay, so I think this is how I want to do this. Okay, so let's go back to render now. So if the variant and gizmo variant, and we're going to do this, it's going to be free. I guess those shouldn't be horizontal only and vertical only since technically you can change that. So we'll fix those. Okay, so we got that. Okay. So now what we can do is if we want to render these, we'll render free move, vertical move, horizontal move. Yes, I think this is how we want to do this. Okay. So we'll render the free move, which is just gonna draw a square. Um, and actually, I don't really, these don't need to be separate functions because it's all part of one thing. I've been trying to get better at this. If your function isn't being reused, it shouldn't be a function. It should be inline. I think that is probably the better way to code because uh, then you can always collapse stuff if you don't want to pay attention to that. And we can also block stuff out, right? So this is our render translation parts, but we'll see if it needs to get to that point. I don't think it does. Um, okay, so this is render the gizmo shapes. So free move is just gonna be a square, which should be the easiest thing. And I have a render, if we call that render, we should be able to do kind of like immediate mode style drawing, except it actually batches it and stuff. So it should we don't have to worry about like performance. Uh, render, do that. And we can say render draw square a filled square, and the start is going to be this position. Uh, so we can do cmath vec2 from 3, which is just going to strip off the third portion of this vector because we have a 3D position, but since this is 2D, we don't care about that. Um, well, actually, we probably do. Well, no, for 3D gizmos, I'm going to have to do something different. Okay, <laughs> so uh, that's something else I'm going to have to encode in here eventually. We'll do that, this position. We give it the position, the size. Uh, I'll give it like a size of that for now. I can't quite remember what my projection matrix is and everything. And then we can change this later. Uh, draw filled square. What if I want to set the color? I think I can set the color by doing push color. Yeah, I think this is how we can do it. And then I can do like a color value so if we just go here I'm gonna have to revisit my render I haven't taken a look at it in a while so there's definitely gonna be some changes that we will probably have to do um, actually no we don't need to do this because I have predefined colors which we should use so include core colors and what we'll do is right here I will do colors 
accent red, and we'll do four, which should be a good color. And then we can say render pop color. And that should fill this square with this color and we should be good. Uh, and let me just make sure that's true. So if we go into here, draw filled square, uh, looks like this does nothing. So we have to go ahead and implement this real quick. Um, I do have draw square though, and this does lines. And I guess the lines are supposedly working. I don't know if this is true or not, but we'll see. Okay, so how do we do all this? I need to go look at how I'm doing some of the other stuff real quick. So I have draw textured quad, and we probably want to do something similar to this. Yes, we do want to do something similar to this. Okay. So let's grab that, and I'm going to modify it slightly. Draw fill the square. Yes, and you can see I have a to-do here. Move this into draw list 2D, which is exactly what we're going to do here. Okay. So uh, I will probably want a transform, which no, I don't think we do need that. Okay, maybe we'll pass a rotation in at some point, but for now, this is fine. I don't have to worry about that. So we're going to get the min and the max, and don't even think we need this, honestly. I'm trying to think. Yeah, uh, well, okay, we'll do this. We'll do this. Uh, vec2 min equals start plus negative size over two. Right, and so that should give us, and I might have to just change that to times 0.5 because, oh, actually, no, that's fine. Uh, I just need to change this to times 0.5 because I need to fix my operators. And then max will be start plus size times 0.5. This should be negative. So we go negative, we go positive. That should give us the min and the max, which are the bounds. And then for this, we're going to say add colored quad. We're going to give it the min and the max. We don't need a UV min. We don't need a UV max. And now we need to go to draw list 2D. Uh, the definition, which is up here. Okay, so these are the changes. This is kind of how my whole rendering layout works and stuff. Basically, I have these draw lists, and these draw lists have a custom vector, which I should probably replace this with stood vector, but it doesn't matter right now. Um, and then they all have draw commands, and I kind of merge stuff together as applicable. And at the end of the frame, I just dispatch all the draw commands, which are just like draw calls. They just tell me, you know, the texture to bind, uh, the vertex index, and the elements. So, um, yeah. And then we have like our vertices, we have our indices, we have the commands, and then we have a texture ID stack, which kind of abstracts all that stuff. Uh, okay. So, for this, we will have a add colored quad. And I'm going to go ahead and steal that stuff. Vec2 min, Vec2 max. Templates. Oh, no, no. Templates are fine. <laughs> you just don't go overboard, overboard with templates. Uh, these are the one things that I wish C had or some form of generics because this is actually really nice. Like templates are nice. It's the, all the other stuff that you do with it that aren't nice. The meta programming is not nice. <laughs> okay. So we got that. Let's go down to add textured quad. Okay. Which is down here. Okay, cool. And then this is what I'm going to kind of mimic. Draw list 2D. Okay. So this is how we kind of set everything up. First, I need to check and see if a new batch is necessary. I don't do anything smart with merging. It's just like little C11 got you covered. Does C11 have generics or templates or something? You're going to have to uh, give me a link or something about that. But yeah, this basically just checks and sees if we can merge this with the last command. Generic exists. Never used it. Hmm. I'll have to check that out. Uh, for this, what we're going to do, um, I can't remember if I have like uh, invalid texture. I do. I, I think I do. We'll just use in 32 max because I think this is, or actually we'll use U in 32 max, which will signal invalid texture or no texture, right? So we're going to say is draw commands that size. So if there is no draw commands, that, we, that means we need to start a new batch. Or if the previous draw command 
has a texture, which means it's not UN32 max, then we need to start a new batch because we can't merge non-textured stuff with textured stuff the way my shader works. Um, otherwise, we're good. We can just merge these together. And so what that means, if we have to start a new batch, we basically say, let's create a new command. We have zero elements. We have, we get the offsets. Texture ID is going to be uh, UN32 max in this case, which signals a non-existent texture. And then we push that command onto our command stack. We get it here, right? So this is the last command. And then basically, okay, yeah. So we get the start index, which is the element count over six times four, which is kind of weird. But basically all this means is, right, uh, our elements go 0, 1, 2, 0, 2, 3. And then it goes 4, 5, 6, 4, 6, 7. And so if I want to get the start, right, if I want to get 0, or I want to get four, what I have to do is I have to divide by six since there's six for each quad, then I have to multiply by four. So say we're here, if I divide by six, I get one times four, we get four. Uh, stack overflow, okay, let me check that out in just a minute. So basically what this does is this gets us like the zero or the four, which is the element that we want. Um, then I push zero, that plus zero, one, two, zero, two, three, which should do exactly what I was talking about, should kind of complete that pattern then we get our vertices. Okay, and this is where we need our colors. So our color is going to be, we actually need to add that to our, ooh, okay, and this is, actually, no, yeah, we should be fine. So basically, I just need to say, <clears throat> this also takes in vec4 color, which makes sense. Why wouldn't it take a color? Uh, let's go find that. This takes in const vec4 color. Okay, and so then here, how do we get the color? Well, we can get that from, uh, I think I have, yeah. So we have like all this stuff. This pushes stuff onto the stack. So, um, did I just, I scrolled right past it. <laughs> okay, so right here, I think I have like a get color. Yeah, okay, so that does exactly what we wanna do, I think. Let's just double check. This should like return white, I think. <clears throat> let's look for the definition okay yeah so this basically checks to see if we have a color on the color stack and then if we don't it does the default color which is just white okay cool so that's how we want to do that um i feel like that should be a vec4 though but whatever i have i i need to get rid of glm eventually uh but for now we'll say vec4 right so we do that that's good and then what we're gonna do is we're just gonna say vec4 uh, color dot r g b a. Okay, so we'll pass that there and then add colored quad. Then when we're in here, we can just say the color equals the color. And maybe we'll allow them to do like multicolored quads, which I think would be nice. We'll do that eventually. Um, okay, so texture quartz min, Technically, this doesn't matter, so we're just gonna say this is zero zero. Uh, we're just gonna default them to default them to sensible values. Uh, what is this? This is min max, so zero one. This is max min one zero, and right here we will do one one. Okay, and then for the color, we want to do our color. Oh, so that persists. I basically just copy it. Push copies, that persists. Position, okay, that's all fine. Um, and then the draw command actually contains the texture ID, right? So that's that. Okay, so basically what this does, this merges these all into a big batch. Then <laughs> when we go to render, I'm gonna have to modify one small thing. Uh, here we go. So when we render the draw list, we basically check and see if we have vertices. If we don't, we don't render anything. If we do, we upload our projection, our view, we go through all the draw commands. We activate the texture associated with it. And this can be changed to a GL multi draw call, but I'm, I'll am i do that later. <laughs> doesn't matter too much. We can offload a lot of this onto the GPU is basically what an optimization I can make in the future if needed. Um, so we bind the texture, uh, but technically we only want to do this if draw commands I dot texture ID draw commands I did I do that wrong? Draw commands i dot why is it not like that oh i have to say dot data i dot texture id 
does not equal UN32 max, right? I think this is what we want to do. Is it what we want to do? Um, can we bind like a white texture to OpenGL or like a default texture so that when you do a texture sample? So the thing I'm thinking of now is in here, if we open the shader real quickly, C++, this, uh, that, shaders. Actually, let's just open the whole folder. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. Okay, let's open the whole folder. Uh, C++, which is in dev there, and then math animations. That's what we got. Okay, uh, let's save that. This is temp.txt, okay. So we go into here. There we go, we don't need that. Um, okay, so this is the shader default.glsl, right? So we get the position color text cord. Yes, and then I do this. Is there a way that I can upload a texture here that's just white or something without actually having to upload a white texture? Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. Well, that vertex 2D has more data in it, but 85 wasn't zeroed. Wait, that vertex 2D has more data in it, but 85 wasn't zeroed. Uh, can you expand on that Voxer? So I'm not quite sure what you're saying there. Uh, I might have missed it when you when it was uh, applicable. Huh? That's interesting. <laughs> Oh, whoa. Okay. That is very interesting. Whoa. Okay. Uh, maybe I will take a look at this in our NES emulator. Might have to check that out. And you don't know, I normally generate a white texture and use that whenever you need it. Okay. That's what I was thinking of doing too. So we'll do that. That's probably the simplest thing. Um, so otherwise we're going to bind our default texture. Do that, GL bind texture, texture 2D. And what we're gonna do here is we're gonna say default texture, white texture ID, uh, which should be fine. And then we upload the texture slot. So U texture zero. Okay, so this is kind of what we'll do. Also not 85, I meant it. That vertex 2D has more data in it, but it wasn't zeroed. Okay, I think I see what you're saying now. So add colored quad. So vertex 2D looks like this. It has position color texture cords. Yeah, it looks like we had everything. So color, position, texture cords. Uh, what I'm doing here is I'm just, I'm copying the vert. So that pushes it, pushes a copy. And then I don't have to set uh, color again because it's just, it's retaining the color from the previous copy. So if that's what you were saying, that should persist across since I'm not creating a new, a new variable. Um, it's just laziness of me typing. I should probably explicitly put that there because that's what's actually happening. But uh, yeah, laziness is not good. <laughs> okay, so what we'll do is we'll do a default white texture ID if we have that as our texture. Uh, that way our shader does not break. And then it should just work out. Um, yeah, so then it multiplies the color by the texture. And then you can see it kind of, it, it creates the, it finds the data we actually need to upload, uploads that data, buffers it, and the elements and everything too. And then it actually makes the draw call. And then I have a to-do in here to swap, but yeah. How's it going, Mary4F? Good to see you. And Voxers, yeah, no, before you set the color, it wasn't zeroed, so it would have caused problems. Oh, well, in the other version, I had the color set to 111, so yeah. Oh, I think I, would, I think I see what you're saying. <laughs> and Essie Woods, you must start getting pretty familiar with setting up the shader and sending data to it. I have gotten very familiar with that part. Um, <laughs> uh, also reading those OpenGL books has helped tremendously in that regard. Uh, we are running out of time a little bit. I wanna get up and running, at least draw a simple gizmo and get some simple commands working. So we're gonna do the free move.
That's my goal. We have like 30 minutes left. Let's do it. Okay, default white texture ID. So let's go up here. When we initialize our render, we will create a default texture. Uh, uint32 default white texture ID that and then I'll, I'll kind of do an assertion just to make sure we're not breaking stuff. Um, okay, so we do all this. Uh, set up default white texture. Right, we'll do that. Uh, set up screen VAO. Where's that? That's right there. Avoid set up default white texture. Okay, let's go to screen VAO. We'll go here. Um, and actually, I might change that up a little bit. So we're going to say texture, texture equals texture builder dot uh, set width one set height one dot set mag filter filter mode nearest min nearest dot. Okay, that's all good. Format, uh, byte format, RGBA, do eight UI, should be fine. And then generate. Okay, so that should generate a texture for us and it's gonna be an empty texture where we can then upload. So then I can say upload sub image and we're gonna give it zero, zero, one one buffer which is just going to be a uh, white pixel okay the this is make a nice api for yourself guys because it helps out so much here okay so we're going to do this um this is going to be our white pixel what's that going to be uint 32 white pixel equals your x f f f f and that should be good we just need to say address of that and cast that to a uint eight star and if we look in here just to double check what that's going to do it's going to get the byte format yes and then it's just going to literally pass that to OpenGL since we have 32 bits and we have rgb8 ui that should all work out so yeah um and seos i've almost forgotten it all it goes so long between each time i work with it but now i'm finally starting up with the shader stuff again yeah it, it gets to a point when you uh start working with it enough and it's like it's kind of in there at, at that point <laughs> and i forget it too i have to look up like the documentation and stuff whenever i'm doing new stuff but usually i'll just copy from old stuff and then kind of tweak uh voxers interesting funny thing is you could have just had garbage texture but make swizzle parameters always return one for all channels that's true too yeah i wonder if that would cause like a undefined behavior though since it's technically garbage but Interesting thought experiment, or maybe not thought experiment, but experiment in general. We'll have to try it out at some point. Uh, let's change this real quickly. This is what I was thinking. So, we gotta change that texture. Uh, default white texture is gonna be what that is, and we're gonna say default white texture dot in it. Can I do that? Uh, ID. Yeah, let's just do this. We'll say equals uh, texture null. ID. No, I cannot do that. Okay. Anyways, we're just going to hope that it's all set up properly. I guess it should be by this point. Um, if it's not, then I have bigger problems, but whatever. So we're going to do that. Default white texture. We're going to do that. Okay. So at this point, we should have a texture with a white pixel. Should be fine. And then if we go back down to here, instead of doing this, we can say uh, render uh, graphics ID. Okay, and that should be it. <laughs> I know, simple, right? All that stuff, just, yeah, it's not simple, but it is kind of rote. Okay, so now when we draw a filled square with this color, it should draw at this position with this size. Let's make this a little bit bigger just to make sure that we can see it. So, and... Yeah, that should be fine. Okay, and let's just make sure. Yeah, and I think this should just work out. So if I click an object, it should 
add a free move gizmo and that gizmo should go there. We'll trace it just to, if it doesn't work. Why is white the default? Isn't that racist? <laughs> no, it's not racist. It's math. Uh, that is called item potent. Is that what it is? No, this is called the identity. <laughs> okay, so identity means that we multiply this by anything and it is itself. So no, math is not racist. Uh, red and if we do red times white, we get red because one is item potent, not item potent. One is the identity. <laughs> Keep getting those mixed up. Item potent means it's the same backwards and forwards, which I guess technically multiplication with the identity is item potent. But yeah, that's abstract algebra. Not fun. Don't do it. <laughs> uh, okay, yep. Uh, Uvoda is now following. Thanks for following, Uvoda. Good to see you. Don't overthink it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, so we've got, I get it was a joke too, so don't worry. Yeah, just joking. Yeah, you're a math PhD. Oh, hey, dang, man. Math is not my strong suit. I don't like it. So you could have totally corrected me and been like, ah, oh, you're an idiot. Item potent is not what it is. But yeah, uh, good to see you though. Math is always fun. <laughs> Opposite of what I said, but I like calculus and stuff. I don't like linear out or abstract algebra type stuff. Not very fun, but okay. So we've got draw field square. Let's see if this works. Did I not run this? Okay, I did. There was a, okay, yeah. This should return, oh yeah, of course. So we'll just do that for now. We don't need to do anything there. Abstract algebra is not very fun for me as well, yeah. Uh, I didn't like it. I mean, it was, it was cool, but uh, not my strong suit for sure, that type of stuff. Okay, so if I click blue square, we're not seeing anything. Let's trace our code. So if we go into here and we go here. Okay, so active anim object ID is one. So that means that it should return an object. We get a square. Cool. So that's all good. We get a square. It gives us all of our values. It's the blue square, which is true. We call on gizmo. It's not 3D. So we get the gizmo name, which is blue square one, which is the ID tacked onto there. We call translate. This goes get gizmo by name, which we go, we hash the name, which gives us this value. Uh, we call get gizmo by ID, which goes, looks to see if we have that. We should not. Oh no, we do have it because it's been running for a little bit. Okay, yeah, makes sense. So return to gizmo. If we look at the gizmo state, status is none. Trans. Okay, it's a translation gizmo, which is good. The variant is all, that's also good. We have an ID hash. We have a position, which is the position of the square, which also looks good. Last position is garbage because I haven't initialized that. Was updated is false. So was update is now true because we've done something to it. We've called it. Uh, we set the position. We set the variant. Uh, we do that. Cool. So we are creating it. That looks good. Now we need to go. Okay. So now we go to render. We jump into here. We iterate through our gizmos. We have one gizmo, which is true. Uh, the gizmo was updated, so we call its render function. Okay, then we call variant. Okay, so we are getting this. We push a color. That pushes a color onto our stack. We get stack pointers one. We draw the filled square. It all looks like it's working. Uh, okay, so we get min max. I think I already know what the problem is too. Okay, so we get color. Um, that's good. We add it to our draw list, which I probably should have checked, but I, well, actually, no, I don't know. Okay. Let's, let's keep going. <laughs> so we do that. We go down here. We set everything to false. And then we render everything. Okay. So we go, we do all that. Okay. We set our draw buffers. This is going to be in our draw list 2d. Okay, so we go into here. Okay, vertices.size, we have 24 vertices. Uh, that's because we're drawing some other stuff too, which is the textures. So it looks like it's all going through there. Uh, how many draw commands do we have? Okay, we have two draw commands. 
which makes sense too, because we have one textured draw call. Uh, let's see what happens. The second draw call should be our white texture. Okay, so then this one, if we take a look at this guy, uh, let's pop it into our watch window. Delete that. So draw commands dot data I. Okay, so we get that's UN32 max. So if we jump, yeah, that's good. Um, we have the vertex offset is 20, index offset is 30, and element count is six, which sounds right. We have one square, that's six elements. Um, that's our vertex offset, that's our index offset. So that all sounds right. That looks okay. Okay. We bind the VBO, um, number of verts, four, that's correct. So vertex offset is 20. Let's just check that out real quick. So if we do draw commands, or actually if we do vertices dot data plus draw commands, I dot vertex offset, and we do a comma that allows us to do multiple things. So we wanna look at the four vertices. So zero is, yeah, that looks right. 13, five, two. Okay, so that looks like it's incremented there. Oh, is this right? Yeah. That looks correct. Looks correct. I wonder if it's just too small. Next up is render doc, because this all looks correct. I don't see anything we're doing bad here. Uh, the EBO, let's just make sure that's right. And that's six. Okay, so we get zero, one, two, zero, two, three. Yeah, which is correct. That makes sense. Okay, so that all looks correct. And then we bind the VAO and we do our draw call with six elements. Okay, so why are we not seeing anything is my question. Good news is all the data looks right. That's the hardest part. Um, so if I hit the blue square, we should see it pop up over there, but we're not seeing anything. So answer is render doc. Let's pull this up. Uh, only worst thing is statistics. Oh, that I totally agree with. <laughs> I think there's a video of people explaining why math is racist, which is insane. <laughs> uh, Jix, I liked your Minecraft videos, Gabe. Great stuff, by the way. Thanks. Uh, I want to hopefully start making more soon with this editor. <laughs> um, I've been saying that for the past four months. So maybe by the end of the year. <laughs> I don't know, but eventually. Uh, Xpath on I Love Cave, thank you. Uh, and thank you, SUOs, too. Um, no homo. <laughs> okay, so let's go ahead. Let's launch our application. I have finally switched render doc to dark mode. Um, I think somebody asked me about that a while ago, and I was like, I don't know why I haven't switched it, but it is there. Let's go math animations, bin. We're in debug. Let's just grab that. Okay. And then I have to set the directory there. That's our relative path. So we launch it. Let's go here. So if I click on blue square, that should trigger everything. I hit F12. We should have a capture now. Now I can just exit out of this. I'm going to load it in here. Let's make sure it looks right. So we've got this so this is kind of like how it's all structured right color pass one renders to this svg cache which is all the svgs uh render pass two renders to our frame buffer it's upside down because <laughs> OpenGL, i think i hope um and this should just draw all of the elements and then this one okay wait a second we're missing something here we should have more than just this oh this is just blitting the frame buffer never mind okay so inside of here we should have we should have something i'm wondering where we draw And all these draw calls, I can't control. This is nano VG. Eventually this will all be abstracted away and I will cache stuff so that I'm not doing this. But this does not make much sense.
Oh, wait, no, this does make sense. Okay, so draw elements 30. That's all of these. And then draw element six. This is the draw call we're concerned with. Okay, never mind. I am an idiot. <laughs> 65 issues? Oh, does it say 65 issues? I did not even notice that. Thank you, Voxeros. <laughs> uh, I should have looked at that sooner. Uh, what are these? Oh, these are just info. Okay, yeah, these are all just info. Um, I guess I could probably change this to be like, yeah, it's just telling me um, it's going to use video memory. I don't even know what this really means, honestly, but uh, is there a way I can suppress info? Yeah, hide severity info. Okay, yeah. So if we hide info, there's no actual issues. <laughs> uh, that's not I'm GUI. No, this is render doc. Yep. Uh, how have I created this interface? Yeah, this is just render doc. So nothing special here. Okay, so this is our, our quad. We've got our red triangle. Um, yeah, if we look at this, this is okay. So, uh, we don't have a red triangle. Sorry. That was just showing us which triangle we're highlighting. So this is the first draw call, which we can see correlates to these, right? So these are all these quads, which makes sense. Just reversed or flipped. Now this is the second draw call, which should, I already see the problem. So this is 1.4 and that means that this is going to be out of the view frustum. Um, cause the normalized coordinate should end up between negative one and one. Uh, the thing is, why is that wrong? Oh, it's cause the position isn't even right. I don't know. Wait a second. All of these positions. So if the position was correct, it should be, um, this is the blue square, which is that one. So it should be this, which is 4.03 minus 0.75. We're getting 13, 3.75. Oh, I think I'm... No. Let me just double check real quick. Okay, so in our render, draw a textured quad. Okay, so we do that, and then if I go down here, we're not doing anything special there. Um, wait, do I multiply though? I think I do. Let's see, go back up here. Okay, I multiply by the transform. Yeah, so I do transform times that. And that transform, if we go back into here, should give us Where's the transform? Okay, there's the transform. Sorry, <laughs> it's taking me off. Oh, okay, I do remember now. It's because we're, yeah, okay, I see. Um, am I, I'm not passing a view matrix in. No, I am passing a view matrix in. Why are we doing this? Camera centered pose. Okay, I'm passing in a view matrix there. I remember I added this a while ago, this offset which I think was for something else. I don't think this is needed. I could be horribly wrong. Let's uh, let's be safe about this. I don't think that's needed. I think that's causing problems. Let's go here. Uh, get status. Let's just add all this stuff. Commit. Um, uh, gizmo rendering. Start adding. Gizmo rendering. Okay, let's do that. Just to be safe. Okay. And I don't think this is necessary. I'm not quite sure why. I did that. I think it was for some other reason that I had before, but uh, it's not necessary anymore. So take that out. Um, Get rid of that. And I'm going to do control shift F because this isn't a few places. Camera centered pose. Okay. So originally I had to do this because I was drawing it centered on the Nano VG canvas, but I'm not doing that anymore. And I never realized that I did not need this anymore. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so this was actually where it was needed. Where is this in? This is in render 2D interpolation. Okay, yeah, so this is this is a, the original use case for why it was there, but that is no longer happening. So I don't actually need this anymore. Um, but I was stupid and I added it because I thought it was important. So <laughs> let's go ahead, we're gonna remove that. And it's gonna actually move all of our objects off the screen, which will be fine. Uh, Cause I'll fix it in just a second. So we got that, okay. And I think that's it. Okay. So now that uh, that blunder is gone, let's keep going. And Voxers, the only important coordinate really is GL position, and that seems to be off. Yes. Well, I mean, the other positions were important too. Okay. Yeah. So see, this is what was happening. Everything is kind of shifted up, which is not correct. <laughs> And I should have realized that sooner, but I didn't. Okay, so now if we go blue square and we actually move it to where it should be, which would be here, uh, we still don't see, uh, we should see a red square there, but we don't. Um, render doc time again. Let's go ahead. And I've got memory leak now. Where's this coming from? Gizmos, oh, that makes sense. Let's just fix that real quick. So when we free it, Oh, and this is a trick too. So I have a memory tracker, right? If you ever have a C++ object, you can't do just normal malloc because that'll break things. So what you can do is you can allocate the memory and then do a placement malloc or a placement new, which will call the constructor and do all that stuff. And then when you delete it, you can just do call the destructor and then free it. That way you still get your memory tracker, which is just malloc, which mine is at least, but you can also get like C++ objects. So quick tip there. But um, what was I going to do? I was just going to free stuff. What is getting allocated here? Oh, it's because those things are, yeah. I just have to say for, uh, let's do auto iter equals g gizmo manager gizmos dot begin. We'll do that. Uh, and then we'll say free iter because these are all pointers. And then I'll just say iter equals g that. And that should just erase everything and actually free it. So if we do this one more time, let me just make sure that memory leak's gone. Um, and we had two gizmos too from the memory leak, which is good because I opened up two things. So if I do that again, Close it. Okay, yeah, we got nothing. Cool. Let's do render doc again. Launch. No. Okay, so now we should get the same positions at least. So if I hit blue square F12, we exit out of that. Loading the capture. Go back into here. We draw this. Uh, let's actually check this guy out again first. So mesh viewer, this is Okay, this is that one. That's that one, right? Okay, so first vertex minus 1.25 minus 1.49. Minus 1.25 minus 1.49. Okay, so we're getting the same positions now. And let's just make sure that transformed correctly too. Yes, we are getting the same positions now. What if I do... I wonder if it's getting discarded for some reason. Do this again. It's getting discarded for some reason. Okay, so it looks like I didn't upload that. Uh, that is the correct red though. Uh, but why is alpha bad? So it looks like our texture is bad. Because I do want that to be true. So let's go back into gizmos. We are in gizmos. Okay, let's, or actually no, this isn't render. Default white texture. Okay, there you go. So, that uploads that. Oh, am I just, no, yeah. Oh, I am just an idiot. That's, okay, yeah. So this is R, G, B, A. <laughs> okay, I'm just stupid. <laughs> Maybe do a U8. Yeah, that probably would have been a better idea. Um, I think we should be fine now though. 
There we go. Okay, so that's the proper color. That's the proper size. Um, right now, it's the same size as the square. Let's fix that real quickly. So if we go back into gizmos, render. Okay, we're getting somewhere, guys. We are almost there. I, I promise we're going to have this thing moving in 10 minutes because that's about all the time I have left, and I am determined to do this. So let's go ahead. We're going to change this to 0 0.25. 0 0.25. That might be too small. Um, we're going to have a default gizmo free move with <laughs> mouthful, but we're going to have something like that. There we go. Okay, so we get a small little blue square. That's going to be our gizmo that we can click and drag around. Uh, let's bump it up just a little bit. Let's do four or five. Four or five. Okay, so this is going to be, if we go up, uh, static vec2 default free move size equals that. Okay, we got that. Let's go down here. We are going to say this. Now we need to detect if that's, okay, what's happening here? Uh, this just needs to do that. Okay, so now what we need to do is when we handle the logic, which happens here, okay, yeah. We need to check and see if the mouse is over it. If the mouse is over it, we need to set it to hovered. So if gizmo status equals gizmo status none, which means we haven't hovered, it's not active, we're not dragging it, uh, what we want to do is we want to check and see if the mouse is hovering it. If is mouse hovered, gizmo position, and we're going to give it the gizmo size, which is default free move size, right? Uh, and the reason I have default is because who knows, maybe one day we have a setting where you can change the size, all that stuff. Who knows? We'll see. Uh, we need a function, static, bool, is mouse hovered, const vec2 position, const vec2 size do that um, we'll do that gizmo state go down there go down there do that okay so then what will this do this will just say uh, mouse position which we can get back to mouse mouse position world equals oh crap I don't think I have a mouse position world drawing a square stream <laughs> yes that is exactly what we're doing uh, input Let's go include input. I think we're going to have to do something very quickly because I don't think I have this. All right, go there. Mouse. Yes, I've just got mouse X. That's not good. <laughs> okay. Another guy in chat. What's your background? How long have I been programming? It looks so natural to you. Um, background, I went to college six years ago now. Um, so I graduated two years ago. Uh, before that, I started in like mid high school, um, programming in JavaScript in HTML and CSS. That's what I learned. And then I moved on to Java cause I thought, oh, I want to make games and I knew Minecraft. So Java, I learned that by myself too. Uh, went to college, learned more stuff. I learned C++ kind of halfway through that. Um, and just been going. Yeah. I've always liked lower level stuff though, which is why I'm in C++ here. I know it's not a great language, but I do like it. So. Uh, I don't care what people say. As long as you use a subset, it's not bad. Uh, and other people would hate the way I use C++ because I don't use the proper C++ idioms. Um, but yeah, let's do this. Um, I really learned a lot too, by the way. When I started doing YouTube tutorials, that's probably when I learned the most. Uh, it's funny, when you go to try and teach somebody, you have to research a lot more than when you just learn by yourself. So I love C++ too. It's a great language. Yeah, I agree. Well, some people don't think so, but... Their loss, right? Uh, let's do. Okay, so we've got mouse x, mouse y. I need to. Okay, so I need to do two things. Uh, this is not going to work. We're going to get this working, though, I promise. Uh, is mouse hovered? Uh, it's a vec3. That there okay are you starting to forget java no i'm not forgetting java <laughs> i really don't like java that much anymore but that's fine it's not uh java's fine i'll probably use it if i ever have to do like back-end stuff at my work uh right now i'm a web developer too so that's kind of my background right now except we do typescript uh react full stack so it's just javascript all the way man 
uh, not very happy with that, but I have a great coworkers and stuff. So it is good. Um, okay. So what we need to do is first we need to transform mouse coordinates. So like if my mouse coordinates over here, it's not in the viewport, right? So it's not in the world. So first we need to see if it's in the viewport. If it is in the viewport, then we need to transform from the window coordinates into normalized viewport. And then we need to do a reverse orthographic projection to get it into world coordinates. So that's our stuff. Let's see if we can do that real quick. That's what, that's the process we have to go through. Um, so let's do this. We will say void transform mouse. Mm, okay. Mouse to view. Let's do mouse to normalized viewport. And this will take in vec to mouse pose. Right? Actually, I guess we can just return it back to because we can just get the mouse position. So we'll do this first uh, because this kind of has all of our GUI windows. Uh, we put that below on gizmo, on gizmos right there. Okay, we do that. So first we're going to get our input core slash input, right? So we get vec2 mouse pose equals that input mouse x input mouse y okay so we got that mouse position now we want to see if it's within bounds of our viewport which is this window right here uh i don't care epic not now okay it is this window right there viewport size viewport offset okay and is this i'm just curious so what does this do this goes does all this okay is this getting i'm gooey get cursor pose okay does this get user generally sees this this is stored in absolute screen coordinates. Um, okay, so this is in relative coordinates. This is not absolute screen coordinates. Okay. So what I can do now is I can say static I am vec2 viewport offset. Okay, we got those two values. Uh, we will initialize them to zero okay then we're just going to get rid of that so we get the size we get the offset and then oh and this is going to be relative okay fix that and then we're going to say viewport offset equals i am gui get cursor pose screen pose which should get the absolute plus relative okay there we go so we get the absolute screen coordinates there we have absolute screen coordinates here now to normalize it so to normalize it we can say that minus equals viewport offset and then we can say that uh equals times 1.0 over I don't know if I can do this. I think I can just do this over viewport size. I'm thinking if this operator is going to work. It's not. Okay. Let's do times that. Does that work? No. Okay. We're going to do this. Equals um, Okay, do that. Okay, do that. Cool. So we got mouse pose. We normalize it. That should be a negative one to one range. And now we can just do that. Okay, so we go back into here. Uh, normalized mouse pose equals. We want to go input. No, we want to go editor GUI. I promise we're almost there. We're getting somewhere. We're going to say mouse to normalize viewport. Okay, that returns that. Then we want a camera. 
So uh, let's go application. Get camera? No, we cannot do that. Uh, we're going to do that for now. Ugly hack. Okay, we're going to do this. We're going to say struct orthographic camera. Uh, I actually think this is just ortho camera. Do that. We're going to say ortho camera star get camera uh, to do ugly hack. I'll fix this after stream later, but for now, this is what we need. Uh, and export. Let's go there. Okay. Return ortho camera. Uh, camera 2D. Do that. Let's go back into here. So we'll say camera. Uh, camera equals application. Do that. Okay. Almost there. Include application core slash app application. Come on. There we go. Go back down here. So we get the camera. Then what we're going to say is camera. Uh, basically, I just want to reverse that normalized mouse pose, right? Uh, reverse projection is what we'll call it. I guess it's technically the inverse projection. And we're just going to do that. And we're going to say normalized mouse pose equals camera reverse projection. Let's go to ortho camera dot H. Add that function real quick. Vec2 reverse projection. Uh, const vec2 normalized input. Right, that's not going to do anything either. Ortho camera .cpp. Going to go into here. Do this. This is going to be that. And then we're just going to say we do we have the inverse projection? We do not. So mat for inverse proj equals projection matrix. Uh, I guess we have to do calculate projection matrix. Kind of gross. I'll cache those values at some later point. Do I not cache those? I do not cache those. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to do that. Uh, vec4 temp equals uh, normalized input. Come on. Almost there. That, that. We're going to say uh, temp times equals inverse proj. I might have to do that to get that properly. And then we can say return vec2, which should now be reversed. OK. Floats do have divide equals <laughs> 8.45. Oh, it's 845. Yes, I know. But we're so close. I'm almost there. We're, we're going to get this somewhat working. Um, okay, let's just do this. Info uh, mouse pose. Normalized. I said hard stop at 9, right? So I said I wanted to be done by 845, but we've got a little bit of time. Let's do that, that. That's good. Let's run this. Okay, so we should see like negative, yes, 848. I know, almost there. <laughs> Very close though. Um, we should see like negative nine to nine when I move the mouse to the left side of the viewport to the right side, and then it should be like outside those bounds too. Uh, we'll see if that's actually correct. Hopefully it is. Okay, so uh, we're not seeing it at all. Why are we not seeing that logged? Is mouse hovered? Oh, because I'm not. Okay, yeah. Duh. Click blue square. There we go. Okay, so we get negative 20 over there. We get negative 11. What is the blue square's position? So this says negative 16, 1.6. Blue square is at negative 0.5, negative 0.7. Oh, is it because I forgot to apply the. Yes, I also have to do the view matrix. So I can't just do the projection, I also have to do the view, which. Okay, yeah, so we also have to do the inverse view. Um, inverse view equals inverse calculate view. 
uh, view matrix. What is that? Oh, that's not const. Why is this not const? Should be const. It's not doing anything. Const. <laughs> okay, let's fix that. Yeah, that's const. Okay, cool. So we do the inverse view. We want to do inverse proj times, I think we want to do inverse view here. Let's do that. I might have those multiplies in the wrong order. We'll see. But we're very close. We're almost there. The projection looked correct, at least. At least I think it did, hopefully. <laughs> I should probably be nor uh, logging the normalized position first and then kind of going from there just to make sure that's right, but... Okay, so we're getting negative 19. That's still not correct. Hmm. Okay, let's do the normalized position real quickly. Let's go back into here. Uh, we get normalized position somewhere right here. Okay. Oh, I am doing the normalized position. Oh, but I'm changing it. Okay. Let's do this. Let's log that up there. That should be negative one to one. So this should be correct and easy to verify. Apply view inverse first. That might be what I have to do. I just want to make sure this is right real quickly. Uh, yeah, so this is wrong. <laughs> negative two, negative one. So that's, we got to fix this too. Um, why is that wrong? Uh, editor GUI, what did we do wrong here? So we say subtract the offset. So we do mouse X, mouse Y, subtract offset. This is screen coordinates. That should be now relative. Did I get this right? Let's see what the viewport offset is real quickly. Because maybe that's wrong too. <laughs> we need to verify everything. Okay, so offset is 47608. Does that sound right? I don't even know. Uh, let's go to here. Okay, so we get relative offset. Let's go into here. <laughs> okay, are we, okay, whatever. So we get this for our offset. What is our relative offset? Oh, it's zero, oh, I'm an idiot. <laughs> Duh, there we go. That, that's probably what we wanna do. Yeah. Uh, we want to get the relative offset and actually add that there. <laughs> that would help. Uh, let's see if we get correct now. Blue square. Okay, minus 2.3 is still wrong. What about here? Yeah, still wrong. <laughs> okay, so that's still not right. Uh, what are we getting now? Let's jump into here. I just want to make sure this stuff is right. Okay, so we jump into here. We get the cursor position, which is 16,109. Okay, so that definitely sounds like a relative offset. Okay, so then we get relative offset is 95,109, and then we get the overall offset is 614,766. Which that all sounds right. Let's go to here. So we go into here. This is 1342.493, so whatever that just was. Um, wait a second. Okay, let me go back here. Okay, so this is 1342.493. I think this is wrong. I think my operator is just wrong here. Um 1342, 493. So we should have positive, negative, positive, negative. Okay, no, that's right, okay. Yep, so that all looks correct. Um, I think I'm just getting, the wrong offset somewhere. Yeah, and we're gonna have to stop in just a second, unfortunately. Oh man. I 
I'm wondering where I'm going wrong here. I wonder if this get cursor screen pose, what does this get? Let's check this out. Okay, current emitting position in absolute coordinates. I wonder if we're doing this at the wrong point. Yeah, maybe we should just be doing this. Like, okay, so we do that. So if we do this, that should get us where this is, which is where it's drawing that image, right? Because then we do the image there. So that should be correct no matter what. If it's not, we have other problems. Oh, actually, I think I already know what it is. So we do that. Plus equals I am GUI. That's what we're missing. Okay, I think that's what we're missing. So equals that offset. Okay, fingers crossed this will work. Uh, we've got four minutes. This is gonna be on your mind all weekend. I know, that's why I'm trying to get it here now. No, minus five, <laughs> that's even worse, minus four. That's not what we wanted. What is this? This is position always rounded up to the nearest pixel. Is this the screen position though? Uh, I am GUI get window pose. Yeah, I think this should be in screen coordinates. Okay, I'm not quite sure. Oh man, bring your laptop. <laughs> Nah, it's all good. You have to minus window. Minus window pose? Well, this is the offset though. So I would think we'd add that to it because we're trying to get the absolute offset there. But uh, let's just do that. We'll see. Oh, wait. Okay. Zero, one. That's one. That's zero. Vox riffs, you did it. <laughs> okay. I think that's it. Thank you. Uh, so now if we were to, let's go ahead and just see if the other thing's right now. Um, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to go very far with this, though. So let's see if this is right. Uh, we should get the squares position if I hover over it, which we do that. Blue square, hover there. I get 4.2 minus 2.6. That's wrong. Let's swap those multiplications. <laughs> yes, 50 out of 50 for Voxers. I agree. <laughs> Uh, let's go. If we go to our camera and we do this, that, uh, let's see. And we go back in here, blue square. Uh, that should be 4.2 minus 2.6. That's still wrong. We should be getting minus 0 0.5 minus 0 0.7. Maybe I should be doing temp times this stuff. I can never remember what left to right or right to left with uh, GLM. It's one of the reasons I want to get away from it is because no idea how they do their matrix multiplications. No, nope, that's still wrong. Okay, well, we are much closer. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I hope you enjoyed the stream. Uh, next time, we will hopefully be completing this, or I might complete it in the off time, and then we'll add some more stuff in the next stream and stuff. But thank you for watching, guys. I'll see you next week on probably Saturday or Friday night. So see you guys.